Paul or, or Fabio? Uh, Daniel, where are you? Uh, where am I physically? I'm. I'm no, no. Oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I'm. I'm happy. To, I'm happy to introduce Daniel if, if nobody has lined up to do it. This okay, is Chef. Okay, go ahead, Chef. Actually, actually, I'm. A, I'm a little confused. Did you just send an email about another talk by Alex or what? Which challenge? Hi, that's me. I'm giving the second talk. Oh, but. Oh, did oh, I'm. I'm sorry. I think I've confused people with the. Uh, SMA luncheon or, 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 or whatever it was, but uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, don't worry, Andy. That was a, a talk that already happened today. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I already uh, missed it. Okay, <laughs> was it recorded so that Andy can see it? I believe so, yeah. It, okay, so send Andy, send Andy the link afterwards. Sure, okay. So go ahead, Shep. Uh, why don't you introduce uh, Daniel? Okay, so, so uh, um, so uh, Daniel first came to uh, work on the EHT when he was already an undergraduate uh, at MIT and uh, kind of blew us away with a lot of work he was doing on space uh, VLBI and went on to go publish a paper on forward-looking space VLBI architectures to create an EHT array that was not limited by the confines of our dear planet. And, uh, and since then, he come, he's come to uh, Harvard as a graduate student and he's now in his second year, uh, true. Daniel, second year yep, time so flies. So this fugit, yeah. so I wanted to make sure. Um, and uh, and and he has uh, continued to do some uh, some fantastic work on imaging uh, and modeling, and uh, and now he is turning some of his attention to theory, and he's come up with some some very interesting ways to discriminate uh, through models of accretion through looking at magnetic fields and decomposing them in, in very interesting ways that have great traction on the EHT observations, and that's what he's going to talk to us about today. And, and the, I should mention also that there was a paper on the archive last night that came yeah. out, uh, I guess, as a prelude to this talk. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yep. this, 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 is this formally published now? It's been accepted. Is that yes, true? Yes, it's accepted and on the archive as of yesterday. Perfect. Perfect. Good, Ayabi. All right. Uh, take it away, Daniel. Yep. Uh, so can everyone see this all right? Let me get this window out of the way. Yep. There we go. So uh, thank you, Chef. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, right. So. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm Harvard affiliated and also BHI affiliated. I have an office in the grad office and I, I miss it dearly. I you know, miss all of you and I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm here today to talk about a paper I've been writing with George Wong and Ben Prather at UIUC uh, called Discriminating Accretion States via Rotational Symmetry in Simulated Polarimetric Images of M87. So this was just accepted to AppJ. It's on archive as of yesterday. Uh, so you can all go take a look if you're interested. Uh, this work is primarily, a, you know, sort of in service of the EHT collaboration, uh, sort of as a, a tool for the forthcoming polarization results. So I, I hope this will help you know, excite you about uh, what, what lies ahead. So M87, first observed as a linear feature by Curtis in 1918. Uh, here we are 100 years later, looking at a booming jet of you know, material moving relativistically fast, direct, almost directly towards us, uh, with the obvious question of what exactly is launching this you know, tremendous amount of fast moving material and you know, exactly how does that work? And you know, the short answer is a black hole, but the long answer is in the complicated interplay of magnetic fields and accreting plasma at the near horizon structure of the black hole. Well, thankfully, recently got a very close look at uh, you know, the inner accretion flow of MD7 in the form of the EHD images. However, these images were made just using Stokes I or total intensity information. So there's no polarization information in these images. They're still really cool, I think. You know, we see the shadow, we are able to extract perhaps a sense of rotation from the asymmetry of the image, but there's still much more to the story of connecting this very close in region of the black hole to this jet that we've been looking at for 100 years. And much of that story lies in the magnetic field. So one question we might ask, is what can we learn about the magnetic fields in the accretion flow if we were to put the polarization information back in? So this is the topic of you know, forthcoming EHT work, but it's something we can look at right now in simulations. But first we need to think about the theory. So there are two favorite models for jet launching that we're all familiar with. There's the Blanford and Znayek mechanism and the Blanford pane. These models differ primarily in where they anchor the uh, magnetic field lines in the accretion flow and where the energy comes from that goes into the jet. 
So in BZ, it's you know the energy is coming from the you know, pole itself, uh, and the field lines are anchored on you know, on the uh, horizon. Whereas in pain, they're anchored in the disk, and it is the kinetic energy of the disk that's you know, feeding uh, these these outflows. Um, and in, just from looking at GRMHD simulations, BZ you know, shows up. DP is associated primarily with lower power structures like disk winds and not so much these booming jets that we've been looking at at M87. There's another crucial prediction for that the BZ jet power goes with the spin and magnetic flux squared. So you, know, it, it, you may have seen this more, more recently or, or just more commonly in its dimensionless form. So this dimensionless magnetic flux, flux little phi and the black hole spin A star. So it goes with both of these squares. This is a recipe for very powerful jets. And it means that in the analysis of uh, you know, images of, or, or, or interferometric data of the inner accretion flow at M87, we have lots of reasons to care about spin and magnetic structure for analyzing jet or connecting the dynamics we see in the inner flow to the dynamics of the jets. So just a, a note on the accretion zoology here. There's two bins into which these uh, the accretion states of the hot accretion flows uh, that we you know, assign to M87 it can usually be sorted. So there's standard and normal evolution, or, or same, and magnetically arrested disks, or MAD. So you can think of MADs as something of an end state for accretion, in that a hole that is accreting uh, material that has some you know, over, overwhelming handedness to it, or, or, or direction of the field will eventually accrue uh, a dominant you know, direction to the magnetic flux embedded on the horizon, and beyond a certain point, which is in dimensionless flux uh, 15, um, the flow will be arrested, uh, meaning that the normal sort of steady accretion that might, one might associate with, with SANE you know, is halted and you know, clumpy accretion is favored, where uh, we also see these vertical or uh, poloidal field lines that respect the handedness of the, of, of the, uh, of the black hole's you know, embedded flux. Uh, or magnetic flux. Whereas in SANES, these field lines could, in principle, just be sheared out along the uh, flow lines in the accretion. So you might see something more toroidal. Well, if we're ever going to have hope of you know, actually mapping these field lines, we need radiation that traces it. And thankfully, synchrotron radiation is you know, dominant at the 230 gigahertz frequencies at which we're looking at M87. But of course, we do need to worry about Faraday rotation. So this is an effect that a, a lambda squared effect that rotates the electric vector position angle. So essentially the direction of the polarization vector on the sky. Uh, and it scales with the electron density and the magnetic field parallel to the line of sight. So this is important both internally and externally to M87 for our purposes. Internal patches of electrons that might you know, differ from place to place along lines of sight could scramble the image. We, we might there, there might be tremendously ordered magnetic fields, but it might be washed out by uh, this internal rotation uh, before it even leaves M87. And externally, if there's an external uh, screen of you know, cold electrons that, that have some magnetic field, then this could rotate all of the EVPA of our image before it gets to us. So we'll need to keep that in mind as we go forward. First, though, we're going to look at a few simple maps of polarization associated with simple fields. So for a toroidal magnetic field, which we might associate with SANE, um, one would expect to see uh, if viewed face on. So essentially looking down the barrel of the jet, looking directly onto the disk uh, from above, one would expect to see radial uh, polarization just because it's perpendicular to the toroidal pattern. I should mention these diagrams are from uh, Alejandro Jimenez Rosales' beautiful uh, 2018 paper. Um, so yeah, so. This is something of a, a weak field picture when viewed face on. However, if you had vertical B fields and viewed it edge on, again, you're going to see polarization that is you know, predominantly perpendicular to the field direction. So they're horizontal up to you know, aberration effects that can twist things around a little bit. What's fascinating, though, is when you look at vertical fields face on rather than edge on, as shown here. So these low in inclination viewing of material that's, that's rotating and also threaded by vertical fields does not just show a zero polarization map. The combination of aberration and light bending effects create a twisting, a, a swirling EVPA pattern where the handedness of the swirls 
respects the, the rotation of the material. And so the fact that the material is moving is crucial. But moreover, it, it, we see something here, and this is a, a geometry that we can assign to a mad state at M87. If M87 is indeed pointed right at us and is in the mad state and has you know, these booming uh, poloidal or, or vertical fields, then we might expect to see some twistiness. So there's a, a nice inference happening here where these polarization maps trace the magnetic field structure, and then based on accretion theory, we are able to make inferences about the strength of the field based on the magnetic field structure itself. So the geometry tells us something about the accretion history. How might we do so in more realistic simulations? Well, there's the vision that despite all of the internal rotation that might be going on, these you know, polarized images that were all generated for paper five but not used, you know, only Stokes I were used, they're just sitting around waiting to be looked at, uh, they, they're still they're still telling the story of the magnetic field but in the inner accretion flow, you know, despite all of the other uh, effects that, you know, that are accounted for in these models. You know, there's a large number of different heating models and that you know, regardless of matter, same, but the, the, the information is still there, it just needs to be quantified. Many people who have spent their careers looking at these models have this intuition that you know, these mads are more swirly and, and these sains tend to look a little bit more uniform, but it's not clear, it's quite radial. So, we've set out to try and quantify those relations. I'm showing a couple of simulations here. These are a MAD and a SANE, both of which are totally consistent with the EHD image. The paper five analysis, uh, for those who are familiar, you know, we, would rank these close to equivalently. Uh, these are both high spin and prograde. And for those familiar with the uh, Monica Moskabrodska's uh, 2016 sort of prescription for, for electron heating that is used uh, throughout paper five, these are an R high of 80. We won't be getting into the nitty gritty of that. But the point is, according to paper five, these two models are equally consistent. And it would be nice for us to, in a quantifiable way, discuss the differences between them and hopefully discriminate them based on future results. To that end, we're going to write down a polarized image in a particular form. We have an expectation that comes from both the you know, inherent symmetries of you know, a disk that is, has some rotational symmetry in a, a cartoon model of, of its magnetic fields to the you know, viewing symmetry that we are looking basically down the barrel at M87, which means that the rotational symmetry in the disk turns into an azimuthal symmetry in the image plane about the center. And we're going to write down our polarization with respect to some image center in polar coordinates. So it's just a complex scalar field in polar coordinates. And now that we have this convenient form, then we can decompose it. So we write these coefficients as beta m. So we're indexing by m. And these are essentially inner products of the polarized image on some top hat in total flux that has a coherent azimuthal evolution of its EVPA that goes as e to the im phi. We integrate over angle and we integrate over an annulus. So we could integrate over the whole image, but we want to leave the door open for operating on real images, which potentially have lots of untrustworthy fluff on the outside that you might want to excise, uh, or, or you might not trust the, the floor in the, in the shadow. It, very, various uh, images can do nasty things at, at near zero. So maybe you, you want to set an annulus, we want to leave that in the formalism. And then integrate over this annulus and normalize by uh, the total Stokes I flux, so the total intensity in, in that annulus. It might be more intuitive to think about it as a, a radial average of a Fourier transform with respect to azimuth, uh, that we're essentially demanding be radially coherent as well by taking this, this average of a radius. So this is tough to think about without some diagrams. So here's a few examples. So these are the first plus and minus four modes in row major order, so minus four, minus three, and so on. M equals zero is in the center, and we, we count up from there. So, a few things I'll point out. The zero point of our phi angle is at the top of the image. So for this m equals zero case, uh, can you all see my cursor? Hopefully, uh, I'll assume so. So in this case, the EVPA tick mark does not move at all over, over azimuth. And in all of these cases, the EVPA tick mark to the north is vertical. That is, in a sense, the definition of the positive real phase of these coefficients. Now, the m equals two mode, you'll notice in the bottom left corner, is the mode associated with rotationally symmetric structure. So these are the modes that is uh, 
motivated by the, you know, the physical intuition for the system, you know, the viewing geometry and the magnetic fields themselves. So we're going to zoom in on that one. We can pick out this mode to look at the structures that we we already expect to see just from simple arguments from the magnetic field. So for a toroidal magnetic field, you know, it's essentially magnetic field loops going around the image, we will see EVPA tick marks that are perpendicular to those and therefore radial, so that's the top left case. Whereas for those vertical lines that are viewed down the barrel, those will correspond to either the bottom left or bottom right, depending on the direction that the material is actually moving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we want to see if this actually pans out on real uh, simulations. So just for the same two example uh, simulations I was showing earlier, but uh, blurred and unblurred, I've just taken a, a fairly large circle that dropped it on the image and computed these modes before and after blurring. And there's a few patterns that show up. First of all, blurring generically depolarizes images. So you know, we see that these amplitudes will deflate as you blur. Higher frequency modes, so higher M's, will be deflated more by blurring. The M equals two mode is generically large, you know, whether mad or sane. Mad amplitudes are generically larger uh, just by virtue of being you know, more magnetized and, and less scrambled for, for reasons that I can get into later. Uh, but there's one more very large effect here, which is probably jumping out at you, which is that there's a phase slope here. So this phase slope is a rotation effect. These images all tend to have one very bright region and rotating it away from north, which is the zero point of our angle, produces a phase slope that you can eliminate by rotating it you know, back to north. However, if we're going to be looking primarily at the M equals two mode, we don't need to worry because it's rotationally invariant. So the phase will not slide around as you rotate. So for our purposes, we don't need to worry too much. But again, down the road, we're looking at this with an interferometer. So it's worth considering what an interferometer like the Event Horizon Telescope might see. We've got a lot of thin ring experts in the room. Uh, of course, the Johnson et al. paper it used this particular formalism, so you'll, you'll recognize it. If you were to have a, a thin ring, so a delta ring at a particular diameter d, we could uh, you know, prescribe some polarization, a, fra a constant fractional polarization p, and a phase of the beta 2 mode given by beta 2, and just demand that there is a smooth azimuthal evolution of the EVPA given by e to the i2 phi, then we can create essentially those diagrams that we've been showing just you know, actually in, in the image plane. Uh, and then in the Fourier domain, so what our interferometer would measure, we see that you know, our familiar Bessel function for the, the ring in Stokes I, the nice thing is the polarimetric visibilities show a similar response. They pick up an overall phase, just a negative sign, and otherwise they just pick up this uh, Bessel function J2, and all of the other azimuthal structure is conserved. So this has nice properties for you know, checking to see if azimuthally symmetric or rotationally symmetric behavior is present in your image, even just you know, looking directly at the Fourier plane. In the top left here, I've just got a 40 micro arc second ring that's been tapered a little bit uh, and, and just has a constant beta two equals minus I EVPA. So this is, you know, corresponds to just one handedness of, of rotation in the material. And then I'm, I'm showing the interferometric response to the mad and same simulations that we've been looking at for the past you know, many slides. Now, I, of course, have stared at these simulations long enough to go mad, but you can perhaps convince yourself, you know, mad, pardon the expression, but uh, you can convince yourself that the uh, amplitudes in the mad simulation you know, falls off right at the second null of the J, J2, and perhaps more obviously, that the phases, like the interferometric phases, respect the azimuthal symmetry far more than the sanes do. Remember that you know, polarization is an you know, arbitrary complex field, so you don't need to have this UV symmetry that you would expect in Stokes I. And in fact, seeing uh, you know, reflectional symmetry in the Fourier plane is an indicator that you have azimuthally symmetric structure in your image. I've overplotted the EHT coverage here in white, just to make the point that we have coverage in the 2017 data where we need it to you know, see the salient differences in structure between rotationally symmetric structures and non-symmetric structures, or, or between mad and sane in this particular cartoon example. So how do we actually test this on the library? We examine 3,000 each of mad and sane uh, images with a variety of spins and 
electron temperature prescriptions. So this is 6,000 images total. It's the full uh, canonical set that was used in paper five. And these have all been fixed to produce a flux consistent with the HD image, which essentially means that the accretion rate has been set to produce about half a Jansky of flux. We blur by a 20 micro second kernel, which is you know, essentially the instrument resolution of the HD. We fit a ring center diameter and width with the ring extractor, which is a procedure uh, developed by illustrious BHI alum Andrew Shale uh, for papers four, five, and six. Um, and we apply our decomposition over that annulus. Then we break down our results by each mode and look for differences in the distributions of these values that discriminate images that were treat, uh, essentially equally consistent in the paper five cuts. So we, you know, we'd like to learn something new. And so here they are. I've got passing mads in blue and passing sanes in red, where by passing I mean you know, by the standards of paper five, you know, given what we knew before, what are these distributions being separated anew? We've selected our inclination so that everything has the same sense of rotation of the material, you know, just so that the asymmetry actually agrees with the HD image. And just looking at these distributions, there's clearly structure in you know, modes besides M equals two. There's a story there as well. But just naively, blue and red are most separated in the M equals two distribution. There's also lots of fascinating structures in, oh, there's this large bubble of, of failing sanes that are all at very high radial uh, coherence. Um, but moreover, the MADs are sprayed out in the, the bottom two quadrants, and the sanes are all clustered very tightly in the bottom right quadrant at low amplitudes. So if we were to just look at the magnitudes of these coefficients at this particular resolution, the M equals two mode does separate mad and sane beyond a certain point. Now, that threshold value is highly dependent on blurring resolution. If we were to slightly reduce our blurring size, then all of these amplitudes would slide up a little bit and essentially self-similarly, it's actually quite smooth uh, in, this, in this regime. Um, so what this means is you need a pretty good idea of the effective resolution of your instrument or the effective super resolution of your, your algorithm, but if you see a, a model, or you see an image rather, that is su sufficiently polarized in a way that respects rotational symmetry, it will have a high amplitude and it means it's more likely that it's mad. The nice thing about this result is that it is invariant under you know, arbitrarily antagonistic screens that have been placed between you and MD7. You could totally rotate all the EDPA in your image and you would still be able to make this inference. However, if you can measure the rotation measure or at least constrain it, then you can use the full complex information. And in that case, you might be sensitive to spin. So what I've done here is I've binned all the mad and sane results together. So they're, they're colored together, but now just recolored by spin. In the left plot, I've got every, all 6,000 images in the library. And on the right hand side, I've cut out all of the ones that don't fit the paper five analysis. So you'll see in the left plot, there's greens for spin zero, but there's no green in the right hand side because spin zero is forbidden by the paper five analysis. What we see here is that regardless of prograde or retrograde, at higher uh, magnitudes of the black hole spin, you get an increasingly radial EVPA structure. So this could be due to a, you know, a complicated combination of effects of you know, dragging in the emitting region or you know, maybe in the retrograde models, the emitting region is actually the counter jet and so it's getting rotated by material passing through the midplane. It will vary by a model what could be you know, causing this. But given the flux constraint that we have present in the library, this is a handle on spin that we didn't previously have. There's another important point here, which is that if we are faced with a a, uh, an observation that shows you know, low polarization overall, perhaps low amplitudes of, uh, uh, of this beta two coefficient, if we have phase information, then we might be able to discriminate mad and sane based on phase alone, just because all of the sanes are piled up in this bottom right quadrant and the mads are sprayed out throughout this, uh, these, these bottom two. I should mention though, there's a very large caveat here, which is that our metric is sensitive to both magnetic fields and the electron distribution function. So at fixed flux, the scrambling effects are going to decrease very strongly with higher electron temperatures. And so, you know, the MADs, which will generically have lower plasma beta and lower accretion rates, will have weaker internal Faraday rotation, you know, all else equal, and the opposite will be true of the same. And so we're essentially placing a joint constraint on 
you know, the, the R high, so, you know, label, or more generically, on the description for the electron and ion temperature ratios, and, and all of that thermodynamics is built in, in a sense, to these constraints. And so before this is, uh, you know, ever applied to real data, there will need to be a more significant exploration of those effects. Uh, but again, it is a joint constraint. So if you feel as though you've accurately represented the state space of accretion at M87, then you know, this is fully downstream. So just to summarize, we have developed a, a metric for structured polarization that provides a, a new constraints, both on MAD versus SANE, but is also sensitive to spin if you uh, have a rotation measure, and of course, a sort of weak confirmation of the actual motion of the material. And there are some obvious next steps. So you know, we've, this prescription is very friendly to model fitting of you know, just prescribing azimuthal variation onto you know, ring models. I know Michael Johnson and a few others have been working on this in synthetic data. And there's some natural effective resolution tests uh, be done on you know, reconstructed images, you know, checking for if biases in the EHD coverage prevent you from you know, accurately reconstructing this, this variation or if it will create blobs in, in the EBPA where you get you know, smooth evolution in some places and scrambled others. So you know, there's much more work to be done, but I hope that I've uh, excited you about what can be said about a, a existing EHT data and polarization. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I guess we open uh, the Zoom for questions. Uh, let me ask a quick question. Uh, you mentioned MAD versus SANE. Uh, these are popular theoretical models, but it's possible that reality is something else. Right. So you'll be able to tell that both of them are ruled out, for example. So yeah, the, the, there's an underlying sort of prior volume here, which is that we are capturing M87 well just with you know, looking at MAD and SANE. And obviously there's, there's all of these intermediate models, these insanes, there's you know, anything you can imagine you can throw into this and it's just another way, you know, another uh, metric by which you can compare to real data. You know, it's not the only one, certainly. You can think of you know, many discriminators just in Stokes I or Stokes P, but any model you imagine can be fed through some pipeline of comparisons and you know, you'll see if it's consistent. Um, yeah, but there's nothing forbidding inputs from a broader simulation space. So anyone interested in asking a question, please either raise your voice or raise your hand. You need to unmute yourself. It looks uh, like everything was clear, had a question. Oh, go ahead, Shep. Well, no, I, 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 I thought Ramesh raised his hand, and then I yes. saw another hand. No, no, yes, raised. I did. I don't um, want to access the participants. So, yeah, Ramesh? So, Daniel, yeah. Um, I think your definition of these betas, you were using the actual polarized flux rather than the polarization fraction. Is that right? That's correct. So you can rephrase this in terms of polarization fraction, essentially by moving this normalization by I in pixel wise uh, definition, right? Throughout yeah. your integrated region. Um, so that is in a sense, turning this into a purely structural metric, as opposed to a metric that is sensitive both to fractional polarization, or sorry, both to you know, total polarization and to structure. Yeah, so have you looked at that guy to see, yeah. if, does it look much different? Uh, yeah, so we, we've in fact looked at like every possible combination of like where you normalize and where you use you know, uh, normalizing by P or, or, or uh, Stokes I. And yeah, you, you do, it's essentially less discriminating for, for obvious reasons, just because you don't, um, there, there is a, an underlying difference between mad and sane, you know, generic across all other parameters in you know, just total polarization, right? And so that is being folded in to this uh, discrimination. Um, and when you just go to fractional polarization, that gets significantly washed out. So your ability to discriminate is, is much, much worse. So you really only knock out, you know, not knock out, but the, the, the distributions are, are quite similar um, just structurally. You, you can still do some discrimination with it, and it's, it's worth you know, testing if you, are in, if you don't have any you know, amplitude <laughs> uh, calibration 
you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I'll but, tell you why I'm asking this. Um, mm -hmm. When you look at just the polarized flux, then you're obviously dominated by the brightest region of the image. And the bright, I mean, where you have the largest polarized flux is also where you have the largest total flux. And it's this, it's kind of uh, strongly influenced by the Doppler beaming of, right. the, til of the tilted accretion disk. When, so, you look, when you look at the ratio P over I, it's not clear to me that the, the stronger signal will come from the same location on the ring, maybe coming from somewhere else. Right. So there, I can think of a, a few examples where you actually had a, a pretty well offset polarization peak as opposed to the uh, I peak, but I, I agree in general. Um, the other issue is when you have just one really bright blob, you know, just from, from Fourier arguments, this will kind of smear out over all modes. I think you and I actually chatted about this after my research exam a bit. So yeah, the, the, using the polarization fraction will help you wash out those modes. But I think we resolve those regions well enough. Like it's not just going to be one bright pixel, it's going to be a, a bright blob. But the structural differences across those features are still going to give us the signal that we're seeing. And in, in practice, probably are most of the signal that we're seeing. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. But I'm just wondering whether there is some extra information you might get by looking at both quantities. Well, maybe the two of you can discuss it later. Uh, there is one sure, more yeah. question, uh, Halston. Hi, um, I have a pretty basic question. Um, I was wondering if, if somehow you had an independent estimate of the spin and maybe mass of the black hole, could you, would that basically help you infer or discriminate between the two uh, mad or sane scenarios? Certainly, right? Like every, every known quantity lets you pin down this parameter space, and in this case, knowing spin would help us pare it down by a large factor, at least in the, at the spin resolution in this library of simulations. In particular, if we knew spin, that might cut us out like a wedge in this you know, beta 2 distribution. Though the behavior with respect to spin is, I think, not well constrained enough that I would be very confident leaping directly to a uh, to chopping out large swaths of parameter space just because there's more models to look at, there's radiative effects we need to consider. That kind of thing. But yeah, it, it would help a lot. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Uh, we need to move on. Uh, so next uh, speaker, I, I mean, you can hear the claps uh, in the background, I guess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but the next uh, speaker is Halston, and uh, who would like to introduce? Um, uh, Halston, and also the, the same person that introduces should also take the questions. Uh, I just broke into the silence uh, after Daniel's presentation. So who, okay. who will uh, present? I'll, I can introduce Halston and uh, handle the questions afterwards. Um, so Halston is a, is a third year graduate student at MIT. He did his undergrad at Caltech, where he did uh, a lot of different work across the LIGO group, the NR group, uh, did some work with JPL, a lot of thinking about hardcore problems in numerical relativity. Um, after coming to MIT, he's been working with Scott Hughes a lot on various applications of black hole perturbation theory. Um, but in between various various um, LISA-focused and Emory-focused projects, he did the uh, he uh, he and I started working together on a project looking at um, hierarchical triple systems um, that are of interest to both LISA and LIGO. Um, and he's, that's what he's going to be talking about today. Thanks, Carl. Um, all right, so thank you for having me. My name is Halston. Uh, as Carl said, I'm a third year grad student working with Scott Hughes at MIT. And most of my work with Scott deals with modeling black hole ring down modes. But today I'm gonna to be talking about a different problem which I worked on with Carl, which is the relativistic dynamics of black hole triples. So to learn more after the talk or to follow along, you can um, go to our archive paper here. So let's get started. As a brief overview, um, I'm gonna go over some astrophysical motivation and then talk about the COSI mechanism and how that relates to driving mergers. And then I'm gonna talk about three body one pn effects and how that corrects the COSI effect. And finally, some numerical results. So we still aren't certain how the binary black hole mergers detected by LIGO formed. But 
one way to accelerate the merger of a binary black hole is through the presence of a third body. We call the orbital perturbation due to this third body the Kozai mechanism. So one astrophysical scenario where we expect to observe three body systems would be in galactic nuclei. Um, for instance, you have a stellar mass binary black hole in orbit around a supermassive black hole. So as just as an example, um, there has been some theoretical research studying the detectability of these triple systems. Uh, I would also like to note that it's interesting that there have been observations of gas clouds around Sag A star, and these gas clouds have been interpreted to be the product of COSI driven mergers. So this is from the UCLA Keck group, and you can see various stellar orbits. Um, what's not shown is a gas cloud G2, which they have interpreted as being a, um, a, a merger. Um, so how, how does this effect work? I would say that there are three essential ingredients to understand. Um, the first being that stable triple systems interact over long time scales up to millions of orbits potentially. Um, the Kozai effect from the third body can drive up the eccentricity of the inner binary. And since gravitational radiation, the gravitational radiation time scale drops with eccentricity, the merger process is accelerated. And if we're modeling the gravitational wave emission, we bet better check if the other post Newtonian effects will also play a role. So there's, um, these will interplay when you model the hierarchical triple. And on the right, I just um, posted a, a recent image of a triple AGM, um, just for fun. Okay, so if the third body is far away, we can treat the dynamics perturbatively. So this is our triple system. And in the limit that R in, over R out goes to zero. You have two Keplerian orbits. There's an inner orbit and there's an outer orbit and they don't interact. But at leading order, the two orbits can interact weakly. This means that over a single period, the net change to each orbit would be small. Um, so significant orbital changes only occur on time scales much larger than the orbital period um, and over many orbits, some effects will be averaged out, whereas others will accumulate. So in, in orbital perturbation theory, it's typical to work with the orbital elements rather than the separations and velocities of each orbit. And you can do this by mapping the six degrees of freedom on each orbit onto 12 orbital elements. So I'm just gonna go through examples of what those orbital elements are. Uh, we have a inclination from a reference direction for each orbit, iota. There are also, you want a, a phase to track the instantaneous uh, position of the bodies along the orbit. So this could be the true anomaly or eccentric anomaly um, and also eccentricity, which you are probably familiar with. So the, um, like I mentioned earlier, some perturbations will average out over an orbit and I'm gonna call these and refer to these as the periodic perturbations. So they don't accumulate over time. So they're orbit average free. On the other hand, there are also perturbations that accumulate over each orbit and I'm gonna to refer to these as the secular perturbations. Um, and since we'll be integrating some triple systems over thousands, millions of orbits, we are mainly interested in the secular evolution. So just uh, as an example, if we were to model the eccentricity of the inner orbit, there would be a periodic component and a secular component. Um, and we can separate the two parts by demanding that the periodic perturbations have um, average to zero when we define a suitable average. Um, all right. So the, I'm gonna talk about the post-Keplerian expansion. 
uh, and how that we can use that to calculate the secular evolution. So uh, we start with the Einstein and Phil Hoffman equations. So these are the, the 1 pn uh, equations of motion and do that for a three body system. And we wanna look at the relative acceleration between body one and body two. And we can group the acceleration in terms of a Keplerian component and these corrections. So this is a schematic of the expansion. So in the upper left quadrant, there is the Keplerian forces. So this is delta to the zero, where delta is the PN parameter. And it's also epsilon zero, where epsilon is A1 over A2, where A is the semi-major axis. Um, so as you know, the Keplerian force is GM over R squared. And that if you only included the Keplerian force, the orbital vectors E1, J1, they're not going to change. If you were to include the 1pn force in addition to the Keplerian forces, you would find that the um, eccentricity vector would change by uh, at, the rate, at the rate of delta over the inner um, binaries period. So this is just the 1pn precession. And if you were to include the leading uh, quadrupole acceleration due to the third body, which is not shown, but the effect is to perturb both the E and J vectors by uh, at a rate of epsilon cubed over the inner um, orbits period. Uh, and finally, there are these cross terms, which are the 1pn effects that are due to a third body. So this is the 1pn quadrupole quadrant. And I want to keep the delta and epsilon definitions at the bottom left so you don't forget. All right. So what, what does the evolution look like if we were to only include these effects? So just the Keplerian uh, forces and the quadrupole forces. These are Newtonian. So you get the leading Kozai effect at epsilon cubed quadrupole order. And um, like I mentioned before, these forces are epsilon cubed relative to the Keplerian accelerations here. Um, I'll, I'm using forces and accelerations interchangeably. Um, and you can go through the calculation and you'll find that the secular perturbations on the inner orbit uh, go as epsilon cubed over the inner period. And um, and the limit that the inner binary is uh, in the reduced mass um, goes to zero limit, uh, or the, sorry, the asymmetric mass goes to zero, you find that the uh, eccentricity and, and inclination will oscillate in phase. And this is described, well, one way to interpret this is that the outer orbit is exchanging angular momentum with the inner orbit, and that the eccentricity and inclination are varying over secular time scales. So how does this relate to mergers? If we initialize an inner binary with near zero eccentricity, but we give it high inclination, so the outer orbit and the inner orbit are very inclined initially, the cosine mechanism will drive the eccentricity up. So that's what you see here at this first peak. Um, and at each eccentricity peak, the gravitational wave time scale decreases by a factor of over a million. So that's, this is the Peters formula. And at each eccentricity peak, if you were to zoom in, you would see the, um, the orbital size drop due to gravitational wave emission. Um, so as a result, the merger is accelerated. And as a result, people have uh, referred to the COSI mechanism as, as uh, a way in which to generate binary black hole mergers. But, what happens if we include the 1pn pericenter precession of the inner binary in addition to the COSI effect at quadrupole order? So if we include the 1pn precession, um, it can suppress the COSI mechanism and average out the secular eccentricity growth. So now you no longer have the eccentricity spikes and um, it's nothing, uh, nothing happens. And this is an example of how the uh, of how two-body 1pn terms are important. So you can estimate 
the time scale for the 1 p.m. precession and compare it with the time scale for the COSI effect. And you find that, in, at least for these parameters, the time scale for the precession is shorter than the COSI effect. And so um, in this system, we would need to at least include 1 p.m. terms to get an accurate picture. So what about if the two body 1 p.m. terms are important, what about these three body 1 p.m. terms that are due, that are 1 p.m. but also due to a third body? Um, how do those affect the COSI uh, effect, uh, mechanism? So if you go into the literature, you'll find that most COSI studies only include the two body p.m. relativistic effects. So that's epsilon zero to, and some delta to the k. So that's, they're going to include the COSI effect, which is the quadrupole, maybe the octuple terms. Um, and to treat relativity, they might only include the two body PN uh, effects that are in this row. Um, however, there are a few studies which do include the three body PN effects. That is the everything that is in, in this quadrant. And here are those papers. Uh, the reason why I decided to revisit this calculation is because there's some disagreement in the literature of the results. And also, the, these studies look at a, a different part of parameter space than I was hoping to, to examine. So uh, I decided to recalculate the three-body PN terms um, and do my own uh, work with my own, uh, as self-consistently as possible, uh, calculate these. So I just want to give some background of how to calculate these uh, mixed order terms. So in general, the perturbation on an element xi, where that's the i, is going to be some index over the 12 elements. So there's inner eccentricity, outer eccentricity, inclination, some other orbital angles. Um, it's a linear function of the perturbing acceleration uh, a. So these are this is referred to as Lagrange planetary equations. Um, a detail is that you can use the two time scale approach to account for the fact that the orbital elements do vary on the secular or periodic um, manner, and you fold that into the analysis. So let's uh, go into some details here. So uh, we have the perturbing acceleration, which is anything beyond the Keplerian force that we're going to be looking at. So there's the COSI acceleration, there's the 1PN acceleration, there's these three body effects that I mentioned. Um, and when you evaluate the equation perturbatively, you can either evaluate them using the zero with order orbital elements. You can also evaluate them looking at some corrections to the orbital elements. Um, so what if you take the, what if you take the COSI acceleration from the Einstein and Phil Hoffman equations, for example, just isolate this term and plug it in, you'll get that the perturbation due to the COSI acceleration is going to be epsilon cubed over the inner period. Um, furthermore, you can integrate this perturbation and you can find that the change to the orbital element will scale in the same way. So that's pretty predictable. Um, you can do the same thing with the 1pn acceleration. So the 1pn acceleration will induce a, the 1pn precession at a rate that is, goes as delta over pn. -er. And similarly, you can find the, um, the effect. Uh, you, can, you can evaluate the, the, the uh, perturbation on the orbital elements. And, um, and that's great. So that's, that's the leading order case. Uh, to get these cross terms or these three body PN terms, you can do the same thing. You can, you can find the accelerations that go as delta epsilon um, that are mixed order and you can evaluate them and you can find these direct cross terms. And so I'm going to refer to these as the direct terms because they come directly from the equations of motion. Um, however, there are some other three body PN terms which you can calculate. Um, so what if we took the, the COSI acceleration and we were to include um, the, we were to evaluate the equation taking the, the leading order corrections to the orbital elements. Then if you expand everything, you'll find that you 
retrieve the COSI perturbations, but you also get these cross terms, which are the indirect feedback corrections. So you can consider this as a relativistic correction to the COSI perturbation. And um, it's very important that I found to include both the direct terms and the indirect terms in the analysis. They both play a really important role in secular evolution. All right, great. So um, when would we expect these three body PNFX to be important? Well, uh, we would expect them to be important when the secular effect from these three body PNFX is at least comparable to the one PN precession effect. So one regime where this could happen is uh, when you have a supermassive black hole and you have a inner binary that's in orbit around it. So this is the total mass is much greater than the inner binary's mass. So if you go through the calculation, you'll find that the lowest order three body 1pn term is actually the de Sitter precession of the inner orbit's angular momentum about the um, outer orbit's angular momentum. So this is uh, actually, it's an agreement with the geodetic precession. So if you take, for example, if this were a point particle and it had spin and you were to parallel transport it around the supermassive black hole, that precession rate is the exact same thing that you get when you replace the point particle or uh, with a with the inner binary with some angular momentum. Um, this is the expression and it goes as delta epsilon to the five over two. So let's compare that precession frequency with the 1pn precession frequency, which is the, uh, this is the expression here. And when we're working with the hierarchical triple, we have the inner binary's uh, size is gonna be much less than the outer binary size. But if the, um, the central black hole is massive enough, we can satisfy this relation and the three body 1pn effects will become important. So um, in summary of the previous few slides, if the inner binary is um, much less massive than the total mass of the system, then three dominant um, three body 1pn effects emerge. So you have the de Sitter precession, uh, you also have the feedback corrections to the 1pn precession. So this is a, a, a correction to uh, the standard 1pn precession due to the third body. And as I mentioned before, there are relativistic corrections to the COSI effect. This third one is really important because it's not just a precession, it actually affects all the elements, the eccentricity, um, the semi-major axis, it affects the inclination. Um, so including this effect is, uh, is key to some of the results I will show. Um, now that I've gone over some of the derivation and some of the features, uh, I'm gonna show some um, numerical results. So as a simple test, um, I'm going to temporarily ignore gravitational wave emission and also the higher order octopole COSI terms and only include the quadrupole COSI terms. So for this system, the pericenter angle, omega. So omega describes the, um, how far the pericenter angle is from your reference plane. And um, if you track this over time, only including the COSI and the 1PN terms, you get this, it oscillates um, in a fixed range of angles. So one, you could say it's uh, oscillating or librating, um, those are the, the same thing. Um, meanwhile, the inclination and the eccentricity are oscillating in phase. So you have the system kind of jiggling around, um, and while it's jiggling, its eccentricity and its inclination are also um, changing. And the three body, 1pn effects will modulate the amplitude of the COSI cycles because it allows for the transfer of angular momentum between the two planes, specifically the LZ component, which is the Z component of the angular momentum scaled by the reduced mass. So as I mentioned, the inclination and eccentricity and pericenter angle oscillate in phase. 
Um, so when you uh, only include the COSI and 1PN effects, you get closed contours and phase space. So the example I showed, which the periceron angle was jiggling between two values, uh, that would describe one of these orbits. Um, there are also orbits where the pericenter angle would circulate from zero to two pi and, and wrap around. Um, and if we add the three body PN effects, you see that the trajectories um, look a lot different for these two in particular. So these are initialized with the same um, parameters and the trajectories are chaotically thickened in phase space. And in some cases, the eccentricity reached is a lot higher. Okay, so that was a, a simple test. I'm gonna go and add back in the higher order COSI optical terms. And I'm also gonna add the Peter's gravitational wave formula to see the effect um, on the COSI induced mergers. So I'm gonna be including these and comparing the effect of adding these as well. So this is just one, one uh, case. And the red trajectory shows if you include the COSI through octopole order, uh, you include the one PM precession and you include the gravitational wave emission. So uh, this trajectory will eventually merge, but I decided to cut the window because it turns out if you add the three body PN effects, the system merges a lot faster. Um, not only that, the maximum eccentricity reached, so that's the maximum eccentricity um, globally, and also the eccentricity entering the LIGO band at 10 hertz is greater. Um, and you can see, so this is the semi-major axis, the eccentricity inclination, and the LZ component, which I mentioned earlier. And so this is just one example, and I wanted to show a, uh, I, I also did a population study to show that this is not an isolated case. There's actually a systematic effect going on here. Um, so first, uh, in the population study, uh, what we did was we initialized a bunch of triple systems with different inclinations. And for this panel, I'm only including the standard effects, the COSI, 1PN, gravitational waves. Um, and if you have a highly inclined system initially, you can reach very high eccentricities, which is what I mentioned earlier. If your system is initially, uh, if, there's, if they're very coplanar, then the COSI effect is weak and you don't really reach very uh, large eccentricities. Um, and I'm plotting the maximum eccentricity, the eccentricity in the LIGO, entering the LIGO band and also the merger time. So if we add the three body PN effects, we see the main result that I'm seeing is a systematic increase of eccentricity in the shoulder here for moderately prograde inclinations. So uh, this green dot is the case that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, and if you were to go and look at any of these other cases, they look the same. Um, and what this says is that there, there is a, a, a systematic bias uh, for in increasing the eccentricity and also decreasing the merger time when you include three body PN effects. Um, there is, uh, our simulations weren't able to resolve some cases at very high inclination. This is a, a pretty chaotic regime when the three body PN terms um, are, uh, there's multiple of them that you have to account for and they're all roughly operating on the same time scale and things get very chaotic. So we're hoping to go back and um, investigate some of these cases here. All right, so as a recap, uh, the secular three-body PN effects are important, especially when the tertiary mass is large. Um, incorporating the feedback corrections when you calculate these three-body PN effects is crucial. And in some regions of parameter space, you can systematically heighten the eccentricity growth and accelerate merger times by including them. And I want to wrap up by acknowledging, uh, so Clifford Will helped a lot um, in helping me go through some of his papers and extending his work. And uh, also Spadar knows 
and also my advisor, Scott Hughes, for helpful discussions and some uh, funding that helped this project. So with that, um, I'll take some questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Halston. Um, does anybody have any questions um, that, they'd, that they'd like to get to in the last few minutes here? Uh, yeah, so um, Magda? Yeah, hi, uh, just a remark really. Um, in one of your first slides, you showed an AGN triple, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just wanted to make sure that that's not actually a bound, like that's not a kind of system that it has any no. quasi oscillations. No, no. yeah, yeah, that, that's a late stage merger. So one, two, three, yeah, that's not a hierarchical triple. It's just a triple. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's a cool system anyway. I just, yeah, um, it was I think cool. it would be really cool to look at this in the perspective of AGN interactions for supermassive black hole mergers, but I don't think, maybe you know this, maybe are there any sort of observations that you can think of, um, any systems that are suspected um, close in triples? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. I. I know that the uh, uh, the the source that if you can go through, you can estimate these effects for the triple pulsar, um, and those are weak because generally speaking, if the tertiary is not uh, super is not very massive, the inner binaries one pn effects will dominate, and so you don't really need to include these effects. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there any other questions? Well, if not, let's um, let's thank Halston again, and I I guess we'll uh, we'll talk this time. Or I'll see everybody this time next week. Okay, thanks to the speakers. Thank you.